Support for the Dice Tower comes from listeners like you, and from The Op, also known as USAopoly, and from GameNerds.com. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, Episode 714, Dual Games. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Jeff has the power. Suzanne joins us to answer questions from the mailbag, and we face off for our top 10 dual games. I'm Eric Summerer, and joining me now, the wonder twins of board gaming, Tom Vassell and Suzanne Sheldon. I don't want to be the wonder twins. Yeah, you two are the Wonder Twins, because we're talking about games that, that have pairs. So like a first and second Wait. edition, <laughs> um, two, you know, two that, that work together, complementary. That's, that's the topic for today. Dual games. Tom, we got to go with this. This is good, because you know what that makes Eric? That makes Eric Gleek. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> if you and I are the Wonder Twins, then Eric is Gleek. I'm the monkey. <laughs> Okay. You know, there are some things. There are some things that when I go back, you know, that I thought were cool as a child, and then when I look back at them now, I'm like, yeah, it was kind of dorky. Like for example, Voltron, the one I watched as a kid, did not age very well. It has not. No, yeah. it it pains me to say so, but yes, it it, it doesn't. Other than well, the theme song, that's it. Doesn't matter, Eric. They came out with a new amazing one. That, but yes, even as a kid, I thought the Wonder Twins were terrible. <laughs> I really, really didn't like them. Yeah, I'm like get just get Batman and Wonder Woman and Superman back, please. I'll take I'll take Aqu- Aquaman, not the Wonder Twins. <laughs> Alrighty, well, welcome Eric, welcome Suzanne. It is June. It is. This has been a fast year. It, we're almost halfway year. done with 2021, and I don't know how that happened. Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yes, one day at a time. But yes, it's not that time is going faster or even slower. It's that the concept of when things happened, like because I talk about conventions and I'll say, oh, yeah, a few months ago we were at a convention. No, no, that was a year and a half ago. Yeah. And then I'll say I was at this convention, I think it was like four or five years ago. No, it was a year and a half ago. You know, it doesn't matter. Everything is the time is stretching and diluting. This is actually a Doctor Who episode we're in. Yes. One long (laughs) Doctor Who episode. Ah, That being said. I feel like people are starting to play games again. Or, I mean, I know people were playing games during the lockdown, but I'm seeing more games get played. Mm-hmm. Eric, have you played any games lately? I have. Uh, I got to play a cooperative pickup and deliver game, which sounds pretty much right up my alley. Uh, it's called Switch and Signal. This is uh, published by Cosmos only in German right now. I think uh, last I heard Cosmos was still trying to decide if they wanted to bring it over in English. Uh, but the components are uh, language independent. So using a nice little printout of English rules, I've been able to play. Uh, the designer on this is David Thompson. He did Undaunted. Uh, and I, I think maybe a couple other titles as well. But Undaunted is the one that I, I certainly recognized. Um, Switch and Signal. Uh, the object of the game, you've, you've got a big map of either Central Europe or, or North America. And the object is to get these colored cubes from the places that produce them to the central city. Uh, I think it's Marseille in the Central Europe map. And it's the two coasts in the uh, North American map. You have to get one set of cubes to one city and one set of cubes to the other. The way you do this is by m- moving little plastic trains around the board. Each train can hold one cube, so you got to guide the trains to there and, and get them to the, uh, the destination city. Uh, the way that you have to do this is by clearing the path. The, the train tracks that, that snake all over the board have at all of the intersections little tokens on them, little disks, that only allow one path through the intersection. It's, it's a switch. Um, and so you can rearrange them to allow them to go straight through or turn left or turn right and create a path that's going to allow the train to, to move along. There are also signals. Uh, you see where this is going. It's the title of the game. Uh, there are red lights all over the board, and these get covered over with green disks 
that that now make it green so that you can travel along that track. There are not many of these green discs, though. There's at least one on all of the cities, and then a few floating around in the middle of the countryside. So you really need to, um, you know, grab one that you just used to to clear the path that's ahead of a particular train. If a train cannot move you lose time tokens, and you lose too many of those, you start discarding cards, and if you run out of cards, you lose the game. So you're, you're bringing new trains on the board. Uh, some of them have to move, like you, you flip over a card that says, bring on a gray train and then move all the black trains. And so you have to move them, and if they run into stuff, you're in trouble. Uh, you can also spend cards to move trains. You can spend cards to switch the switches and change the signals and move the discs all over the board to sort of clear the path for the trains that you're trying to get where they are. And then you cross your fingers and hope that the right trains are moving so you can get the cubes where they have to go. This is a a difficult game. Um, we, we did not do well in, in our first go through here, but I like the clockwork aspect of this, um, trying to stay Far enough ahead that you aren't in danger of crashing into something as far as clearing the path for your trains, but not going so far ahead that you're wasting those actions when you should be worried about something else. Um, The way the trains come out of the board is a die roll in the basic version of the game. You simply roll two dice and there are numbers around the outside and that's where trains come in. I think I want to try a variant that comes in the box where you're flipping tokens. You have a stack of I think 12 or 11 of these tokens um, that represent the die results and you can flip them up so that it's a little less random uh, where the trains show up so you get fewer collisions right off the bat. I think I want to try it that way next time you play it. There's other ways to make it simpler, giving you more signal discs and stuff like that that I may need to try as well because we did not do well in the first go. But I'm enjoying the challenge of switch and signal from Cosmos. Just as a heads up, Eric, a, a smallest of spoilers, that's not the last time we'll talk about one of his games this episode. Interesting. Hmm. What about you, Suzanne? What have I been playing? Yes. Uh, yes. What about you? What's he, what he said. <laughs> what about you? It, it was so, sorry. like, a, a forefront. I was just like, what about you? And I'm like, I'm sorry I did eat the last candy bar and didn't say anything. Sorry, you, let, let's try a different transition. Suzanne, explain yourself. <laughs> All right, I'll talk about a game to try to get out of this situation. And I'm going to say it wrong. Ukatoa. Ukatoa? We'll go with Ukatoa. You better, you, be, you better spell it for those listening. Well, I feel like folks who know it will know it. But this is the new game from Darrington Press, which is the publication, board game publication arm related to Critical Role, the really, really massively popular uh, live play, role play show. Ah, okay. And so it's spelled UK apostrophe O-T-O-A, Ukatoa. And I am definitely revealing that I have not really watched much of the show and obviously don't know that part of it so my apologies to all the (laughs) avid fans out there it's nothing against the show i just time is of the time is very precious and limited i never feel bad about mispronouncing a made-up word (laughs) fair enough true so okotoa is a kind of semi-cooperative game in which we are on a floundering ship being stalked by a sea serpent. And we are trying to ensure that our sailors are the last people surviving on this sinking (laughs) ship. Okay. So you set up these little hexagons that form the platform or the play area, and you can kind of just set them up in a circle. But what's one of the cool elements about this game is that you can alter the layout, which changes up the gameplay. And then there's this really cool sea serpent miniature that's just gorgeous. And then you you've, you pick a player color and, well, you, you've got all these sailor meeples or figures that you're going to scatter around the ship. You just take turns putting them out there. And then it's it's got cards. So the cards are going to let you do things like move the sea serpent or you can swap two sailors or you can make the sea serpent attack. And that kind of thing. So what's going to happen is that you're just playing cards, 
The sea serpent is slowly moving down this line. Inevitably, it will start chomping on some sailors. And a couple of interesting things about the game is that just like between two cities, you are actually going to be working a little bit with the person on either side of you. So the minimum player count here is three. And randomly, you get assigned a color token between you and your other neighbors. And those are the color sailors that you want to save. So maybe I have purple on one side and green on another. Okay, I want to save purple and green sailors. Because at the end of the game, if the last two sailors are purple, then myself and the other purple player both win. But if the last two sailors are one is purple and one is green, the colors on both sides of me, I am the sole winner. Oh. Meanwhile, whoever, whatever other colors at the table, I want to just smash those sailors all out of the way, right? So you're playing cards. If you can play two of the same kind, you can get one action and then you can take another action as a bonus for playing two cards at once. Or you can just play one card, take that action, and then the, the turn passes all along. As the sea serpent moves along, the board shrinks and the tiles slowly disappear from the board. So it gets a little more cramped. That's okay because sailors are disappearing anyway. So it kind of balances out that way. And that's really the whole game. Play cards, move the sea serpent, attack other player colors. Kind of hope that your colors are some of the last left on the boat to be the winner. So it is pretty straightforward. It is pretty simple, and there's a lot to like and some quirks about it that I personally didn't care for. So first of all, these (laughs) sailor figures, they're little colored plastic figures, and they look like little capital A's because they're they're just got, you know, quirky shape to them, and they're people, and they're holding their head and screaming. Ah! (laughs) Right? (laughs) Okay. Yes, it's really freaky. And, uh... That's fine. The problem is they're very tipsy. They, they they're drunken they, sailors. That's why. That's why. They're well, maybe they're, I'm falling down. So they they tip over very easily. They're very easy to knock over, and we did find that a little bit frustrating as as you're reaching for care because you're moving them around constantly. A minor thing, but something that we found minorly frustrating. Also, the the hexagon tiles that you form this board with they're pretty small, and. On one hand, that's nice for table space consumption. On the other hand, I wish those tiles were a little bit bigger. That would have helped a little bit with maneuvering the things. I I think, personally, that's just a personal choice. I would wish the tiles were a little bit bigger. But everything fits in the box quite nicely. I will say the art on the cards is gorgeous. The box is gorgeous. And that sea serpent miniature is out of control. Awesome. Hmm. And I just really appreciate the artistry in the game a lot. It's got one of those things where I think if you are a fan of Critical Role and you haven't played a lot of board games, that kind of feels like who this game is for. And I think it'll be great. I think people who know the show will get into it. They'll know some scenes from the cards. They'll really kind of connect with the IP material. And it's one of those games you can kind of throw down and it's pretty casual. It's pretty relaxed. For more advanced players, I think that, especially people who've played a lot of games, I think they're going to start comparing it to, like, um, oh, what's the Survive and games like yeah. that. And, you know, whether it, it simplifies that formula a little bit in a really great way or not, it's just going to be player dependent. But for me, I wish, I think mechanically I just wanted more out of the game. I Those little tipsy meeples bothered me, but the rest of the production is really beautiful and really gorgeous. And... I love the idea of the massive critical role audience maybe connecting to board games, the board game side of the analog game world a little bit more through a Katoa. Cool. Yeah, this game looks I, – I haven't seen this yet. I, I heard about it when it was announced. It looks like it was not designed for the, the quote-unquote gamers. This almost looks like it would be – Similar to the style of games Bicycle has been releasing yeah. lately. Mm. And those are great. Okay. That, yeah, those have been good. Sure, sure. No, I'm not, I'm not saying they're bad. I'm, I'm talking about the audience these are intended for. Yeah. Um, this almost looks like it'll be sold, I mean, other than the theme. It looks it almost has a feel of a Cracker Barrel game, if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, just the way it looks. That might be the wrong. I don't know what I'm thinking here looking at this. Hmm. I'd have to see it in person. So in... Uh, 
I don't remember, Eric, you would remember if we talked about it off air or on air about the Dice Tower acquiring a collection. Oh, you know, I don't I, I don't think we talked about it on air. Um, I, I saw the thread on Board Game Geek in the uh, Dice Tower forum about it. You did sort of a video unboxing, but I, I don't think we talked about it on the air. That's only three weeks ago, and it's felt like an incredibly long time. <laughs> um, and, and, and I don't mean that, that that sounds super ungrateful, and I don't mean it to be. But a, a board gamer passed away up in Eric's neck of the woods, and um, his family contacted us and asked if we wanted to you know, purchase the collection um, and take it off their hands because it is a vast amount of work. And you might think, for example, and this is kind of a cautionary tale to everyone listening who is a board game collector, you might think, my kids will sell all my games and make lots of money from them. Hmm. You are asking them to do a huge <laughs> yeah. amount of work. Yeah. It's a big deal, especially if you don't know anything about games. You know, we know about games quite well down here, and it still was. We Someone drove it down. It came in a trailer. It was unloaded. We unboxed it. It took about five arrows, hours to open up the cardboard boxes, take everything out. Wow. And there's just so much stuff. Even today, I mean, for the last two or three weeks, it's been cataloged every day. We've been cataloging what's there exactly. Well, that's, that's where we're starting, you know, cataloging it and going through it. Well, some of the good things is this is obviously going to fill in holes in the Dice Tower library. Mm-hmm. And there's some mega Kickstarters in there that I've never played before that I don't have any. I can't keep saying I don't have them. So, for example, one of them, Kingdom Death Monster. We now have a copy of that. Okay. So I will, at some point, probably play it, <laughs> even though you have to put the miniatures together. So I don't know. But a game that you did not have to put the miniatures together that we got is Mythic Battles Pantheon. Now, this came out four years ago in 2017, and it was a huge Kickstarter. I mean, uh, tons of miniatures. It was a collaboration between Monolith and Mythic Games. Although I think, I'm not sure which of the groups did it. It's very confusing. I really have to think Monolith didn't do everything about it because the rule book is comprehensible. Um, and if I know anything about Monolith games, going from their <laughs> Batman and Conan games, they had a four-year-old write those rule books. <laughs> um, but I digress. This is a game in which you take giant monsters... Um, and fight each other. That oh, I'm sorry. That that's the review. That's the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I never got around to playing this. Um, but I went through the rules. I opened it up and I went through the rules and I thought, wow, this sounds tremendously familiar. I feel like I played it and I know I haven't. So I looked it up and lo and behold, I did. I played Mythic Battles, which was a board game Yellow put out almost a decade ago. Um. Mythic Battles was the same thing, almost, except it didn't have miniatures. And it was just like flat cardboard pieces. So I watched my review and I said, man, I wish this game had miniatures or stand-ups. I wish there was expansions for it. Well, I'm taking credit for this gigantic <laughs> Kickstarter that happened, apparently. So they, they are they actually related? It's it's a derivation of the same design? It's the same thing. Oh. It's 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 the it's the same design with some changes. It's a very simple game uh, where you you use you have you have these scenarios, but most of the scenarios are go around fight each other. Uh, might you might have to go collect some stuff, but you you build an army. You each have a god, so you might pick Apollo. They're all Greek gods. You might pick Zeus. You might pick someone else, and then you could take in some heroes and some monsters. So I might have Apollo and Achilles and a Medusa you know, my team. And you also might have some very, very, very expendable hoplites and other, you know, cronies along with you. And there's there's enough to, to do some decent building of armies in the core box, but I got this whole thing now that the guy had pledged for everything, which is enough to fill a small house. <laughs> um, and there's a ton to pick from. I like the system a lot, even if it's fairly simple. The Everyone has something very similar to hero clicks where every time you get hit, you move a stat bar down and your stats get worse as you take damage. The dice system is a very unique system. Um, You have a deck of cards that you shuffle that has 
cards matching all the units that you have in the game, and you draw these cards and you use these cards to activate them. It's very simple, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with running things around and smashing them into it. The miniatures are gorgeous. They're really nice. Although I do have a complaint that I feel... I feel like it's a bit sexist, the 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 models in general. Okay. Um, I said when I was opening up, I said this is very French, um, but <laughs> but you know I was not pleased with that. It just feels. I mean, there's. I mean, I don't know. I, I just play with the monsters for the most part anyway. Um, but I I think it's cool. I'm not sure it's worth the price point because it is a fairly light game. They just did a follow up. Um, Kickstarter uh, for monsters, I think, from Egypt, I think, or from another. Oh, no, 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 from Nor- the Norse mythology. Okay, sorry, Norse mythologies, and I think you'll be able to mix and match them. But I have to say, I liked it a lot more than I thought I would. You know, when I first reviewed it back in 2012, I said this doesn't add anything new to the to the table. This is, you know, there's nothing. What's what's the new standout system? In 2021, I go. It's nice that I don't have to look at 600 different things to figure out how I'm going to attack somebody. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I just want to roll dice and 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 just fight monsters. And that's what this game does. So I'm going to keep it. I'm going to play it some more. Um, I've, I've been enjoying it more, a lot more than I thought I would. And uh, because when I first saw it, I thought, oh, it's a miniatures game where you have to measure things out and, you know, calculate hit points. And I'm going to swing at you. And there's a plus six modifier because I'm, no, there's none of that really. There's a few terrain modifiers, but it's mostly I roll eight dice. I need to get seven or higher to hit Eric on six-sided dice. Is that possible with this system? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, that's real quick. The combat system is the dice are, go from zero to five. So if I'm going to hit Eric, let's say Eric's unit has an eight defense. So I roll a bunch of dice. All the zeros go away. They don't work at all. They're complete misses. Okay. Then the other dice, if I get fives... I can re-roll those and add another number to that. Exploding dice! Sort of. It, but you're only going to roll twice. They're not exploding dice. However, you can use any die that's not high enough to hit the creature to add one to another die. Hmm. So it works really well. So if I roll seven dice, I get two zeros. But then I get two fives and a four and another die. I can use that one die, add it to the four, make that a five. Roll those three fives, two of them. One, I get a four. One, I get a three. Boom, those both hit Eric. Hmm. I don't know. I really like this system. It's really fast, and it feels exciting. Anyway, that's Mythic Battles Pantheon. Cool. So the other side of the spectrum, this is a, <laughs> not a giant epic game. This is a small card game called Fantasy Realms, which uh, came up in conversation a couple of episodes ago when, Tom, you were talking about Red Rising. Uh, you talked about Fantasy Realms being... A, uh, an inspiration for the system in Red Rising, and uh, I had not played the game and had an opportunity to fill in that hole in my ludological experience. Fantasy Realms is from Bruce Glasgow and WizKids Games. It's a, um, I guess, sort of a rummy-style uh, drafting game where you are acquiring cards into your hand, although actually you start out with a hand full of cards, and you are swapping out cards uh, to uh, to create the best system that works together, the best hand of cards when the game is complete. And um, you, you simply draw a card from the deck blind and then discard a card. Or from the discards, the discards are sort of spread out in a, uh, a tableau, uh, you can take one of the discards and add it to your hand and then discard something else, thereby not changing the number of discarded cards because that's the timer for the end of the game. Once, I think it was 12 cards are on the table, that is going to end the game. Um, so you are continually swapping cards in and out and hoping to get them to work together the best they can. The cards come in different suits. They're, they're different colors. Um, and and there's a lot of text on these cards that will tell you that if you have, in addition to this card, if you have these two other cards, then it's worth a lot more to have this card. Or this card is worth two extra points for every one of this suit that you happen to have. And and all of these combinations that, that interrelate and... This has that style of the rummy style games where you 
You may start out the game working on three different aspects of your hand, and then based on the cards that come up that you manage to get into your hand, you might have to abandon. You're faced with that decision when you're like, do I go left or right? Do I abandon these cards and hope that I draw the things I need, or do I try and diversify and, and keep you know all my eggs in this basket? Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, there is a lot of reading, though, as I said. The first time you play this, you're going to be just basically staring at your cards for a long time, trying to figure out how they're all going to work together. But certainly, as you play more, this becomes much more of a light game, one you can play in just a few minutes and um, and, and knock one of those, those games out quickly. I know there are expansions to Fantasy Realms. I did not play anything beyond the base game. Uh, but I liked it as a as a light uh, drafting game, um, and now I'm I'm curious to see how Red Rising compares. Uh, Fantasy Realms, I enjoyed it. I'm glad I like that game. I really would love to play this one. It's it's been on my want to try list. If, if only at a convention or something that I could yeah. go and give it a whirl at. Oh my goodness! It's one of those things. Is is this one in the library, Tom? Oh, of course. Of course. Of course. What a silly question. <laughs> Oh, is yeah. it one of the one of the games that's inside the uh, the plastic containers? Because you've got like six of those plastic containers that have the small card games in them. Yes, and actually, I Eric, I think if you'd like the game, you should try the expansion. Hmm. The expansion is a, it's a simple little thing. Well, I mean, the game's pretty simple anyway. It's it's a lot of fun. Cool. Well, my next game is a little bit older. But I'm such a fan of trick-taking games. I always love playing them. And I realized I don't think I've ever mentioned Rowboat on this show before. So I figured, why not? Rowboat is a, in some ways, it's a fairly standard trick-taking game. And in other ways, it's very much not. So in Rowboat, you've got a custom deck of cards. It's still four suited, but they have like shells and an anchor as the suits instead of the standard hearts clubs and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, trick taking is always one of those things. It's so hard to explain if you don't know what trick taking is, but if you know what trick taking is, Oh, it's, you know, you've got so much shorthand. So it's always, I always feel weird talking about trick taking on the podcast because I'm so afraid that there are people out there that don't know what trick taking games are. And then I know that my description is going to fall very short, but uh, so apologies to folks out there who don't know how to play trick-taking game. Um, so Robo, along with the standard things, like you play a card and, and you want to take tricks and you get to bid on how many tricks you're going to take, a couple of things that Robo does differently is you're going to shuffle up the deck and then you're going to deal out cards in a row up to a certain number or up to a certain threshold is met. And that's going to drive the re- next round. The number of cards in that row, which is called the tide, determine how many cards are dealt to the players, which means that's how many tricks you're going to have. So you can be in a situation where there are four cards in the center. Huh. Or you can be in a situation where there are 12 cards in the center. If there are 12 cards, you're getting a 12-card hand. If there are three, If there are six cards, you're getting a six-card hand, that kind of thing. And then that tide determines the play for each hand as you go down the tide. So if the first card is the three of shells, well, then shells is going to be the trump suit and three is going to be the power number in that hand. Then you finish that hand and you play it out and whoever plays the highest value card in the trick, again, with shells trumping suits and things like that then you play the next hand well the next card is a six of anchors well guess what this time the six of the six is the power number and the anchor is the trump suit so we've seen some trick taking games do this for example fox in the forest does this where the suit uh that that's trump can switch off and on through between hands rowboat does that as well in fact rowboat did it long before because rowboat's 15 years old now or so hmm and I really, really like that. That tide and the way that it drives the game playing switches things up and completely changes the way that you assess your hand when it's dealt to you is something I really value as an experienced trick-taking player because I like that it makes me assess my hand differently. That adds an element of strategy and thinking that I don't have to have in a more standard game like spades or hearts or something like that. 
The other thing is, is that uh, just like in cribbage, there's a knob. So there's a partner card. So for example, if it's the three of shells, then the three of moons might be the knob card, which means it's like the Uber card, which I know. Okay. Trick taking games have weird terminology. I'm so, they're weird. They're yeah. So this weird. sounds a little like euchre, actually. It, yeah. Sure, absolutely. I think it definitely harkens back to a number of established trick taking games and classic games as well. But so it has elements like that as well. It also has special cards. So along with the deck that you get that is custom, you also get some custom cards. So there's like a lighthouse, which literally you get one per player. It literally lets you peek at your opponent's hand for a certain amount of time, which, okay. what the heck, right? And then if you've played Wizard, the tricky game that you get, I forget, I think it's the robot card. You get a robot card, and that is like the, no matter what, I take this trick card. And a couple of things like that. So Robo is a really fascinating trick-taking game to me in how it adheres to some really core principles of trick-taking, but it adds some really fun and fascinating things. So if you are not familiar with trick-taking games, I actually would not recommend Robo to you. I would try something a little more uh, predictable like a spades or a hearts or a classic trick-taking game. But if you're like me, and I know there's a lot of you out there who love trick-taking style games, if you haven't had a chance to try Rowboat, I definitely recommend it. I think it offers a lot of fun and some some stuff that's different that is great for experienced players. Cool. Wow, this is really weird to me to see this game come back <laughs> to be talked about. I forgot about this one. This one was at Gen Con, and they had little Rowboat footprints on the floor oh, okay to get to the booth i remember that <laughs> okay well i just like the name of the company moustache games um but they only ever made two games and then they disappeared ah oh, alas they made this in hike rowboat did better hike was not that great of a game and i thought rowboat was okay myself but it's a very uh Oh, what's the word for this? It's like a theme that anybody can get into. Approachable? Uh, yeah, approachable theme. Thanks. I don't know why. Uh, I'm too cool to even think of these words at this point, apparently. <laughs> All right. Let's go to a theme that's near and dear to my heart. Drinking. <laughs> <clears throat> what? <laughs> Drinking soda? Yeah, no. Um, But you know what is near and dear to my heart? is marbles and games for no reasons. Okay. And that's what this game has. It's called On the Rocks. So this is a Kickstarter game that is from Pen Tree Games. And this is a very, you know, we were just talking about approachable games. This is a very approachable game. And I'm trying to figure out how they made it. And, and the reason I say that is because the Kickstarter raised like $30,000. And this game is on fire component wise hmm. you have these menu boards that you open up they're beautiful boards and they have little holes cut in them and they, you have these different drinks cocktail martini highball type drinks that you are making and you do so by each turn you roll dice and the number that you roll on these dice is the number of balls that you these little marbles that you pull from a bag and then you drop them in cups like mancala style you know one per cup then you pick a cup Take all the marbles in that cup and you put them in your drinks, matching the colors to the drinks. So let's say one drink needs four reds and two greens. It doesn't okay. really get into details as to what the balls stand for, <laughs> but that's probably just as well, you know, so kids can play the game. I'm not trying to teach kids how to make drinks. Gotcha. Um, but that's that's really the game. You complete drinks, you get points. You can also get tip cards, which can help you or hurt other players, but if you if you use a tip card, you don't get the money on the tip. And then there's sometimes bad marbles dropping them, which are called spills marbles, black marbles. And if you grab one of these black marbles, you know, if it's in the cup that you grab, you have to draw a spill card, which is risky because that spill card might say, remove all red marbles from one of your drinks or something like that. Hmm. That's it. It is not the kind of game I think I'm going to want to play all the time on a personal level. I think the components are amazing. The theme is, you know, I, I, I don't drink, folks. I'm a teetotaler, but, you know, whatever. But it's so easy, like an ultimate welcoming game. You know what this game really reminded me of, even though it's not quite the same thing, is Arch Ra Ravels, or however you pronounce that game. Oh, Arch Ravels, yeah. 
our travels, it has that same kind of feel to me. Because in our travels, you're collecting yarn, turning that yarn in to make clothes. Here, you're collecting these little marble ingredients for your drinks and turning them in to make different drinks. Hmm. It's such an amazingly nice production. Great art, everything about it. 25th Century Games is also on the cover. So they've been producing a lot of great-looking games lately, like Kohaku, and I think they they did one of the newer versions of Ra, um, Cloud Control. So some really cool stuff here. I, I really... It's just one of those games where my ranking is higher than my enjoyment, if that makes sense. Okay. No, I mean, I thought it was fine. It was enjoyable. You know, there's, uh, there's a little bit of luck. A little, there's a lot of luck. But, and there's a, it's very, very, very simple. But, man, I can see people playing this and going, wow, is this what board games are like in 2021? And then I will come out of the couch where I was hiding and go, <laughs> yes, let me show you more. And then they'll arrest me. But. <laughs> okay. This is your outreach program. I really got off track there. <laughs> but that's on the rocks. It looks really cute. Want to want to give this a whirl sometime. All righty. Well, let's go now from simplicity to the other end of the spectrum. Three, two, one, go. It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. Let's say I mark off a square mile of rainforest in the Amazon jungle, and I look at the number and size of animals that live there. What I'll find is that there are just a few big animals, more medium-sized ones, and even more small creatures and so on, and there will be tons of single-celled microbes. Or let's say I look at the moon, and I count the craters I can see. There are just a few large ones, and once again, as the size of the crater shrinks, there are more and more of them. Or I could look at earthquakes. There are just a few really large earthquakes, and more tremors the smaller they are. Now, these types of relationships, where there's a lot of small things and not much of a large thing, is called a power law. And they pop up all the time. A power law actually led to the discovery of quantum mechanics, the so-called ultraviolet catastrophe, which I won't describe here, but I include only because it's fun to say ultraviolet catastrophe. And I got to say it twice, so feel free to Google that. So if I make a graph of any of these examples, they will follow a characteristic curve, very high, close to the origin, and then dropping down as we move along the x-axis rapidly at first, and then gradually to form a long tail. Now, as I mentioned, power laws are very common and are used to describe a lot of phenomenon. They have a lot of underlying causes, but are the results of many different types of random processes for the most part. As humans, we see power laws all the time. And when we see them, we think they look more natural. And I'm doing air quotes here when I say natural. Another example is a tree. There's one trunk, a few large branchings above that, and tons of tiny twigs out at the edges. Those distributions just look right to us. So do games reflect power laws? Some do and some don't, and in different ways. First, some games represent power laws through components. The card game, The Great Dale Moody, has cards numbered from 1 to 12. The 12s are the weakest and the 1s the strongest, and there are 12 12s, 11 11s, 10 10s, and so on down to 1 1. This distribution leads to a lot of interesting decisions, particularly as it's a ladder climbing game. It also makes it really exciting if you pick up your hand and see that you got one of the 1 or 1 or both of the 2s. The game would be quite different if there were just, say, 6 copies of each card. Now, rather than components, another option for designers is for randomness to reflect a power law. There's actually a name for this, pink noise. This contrasts with white noise, where the jumps can be of any size with equal frequency, and brown noise, where the jumps can only be very tiny. I talked about this in a prior game tech. I'll include a link in the guild if you'd like to check that out. So I won't go into it in huge detail, but in pink noise, there's a high chance of the standard outcome and smaller chances of outliers. A bell curve from rolling two or three dice has some of this characteristic, but a typical power law gives the most of the lowest result, not the middle result. So one way to create a typical power law curve is to change the die faces. If you have a die with three ones, two twos, and one three, you can start to create that feel. Another way is by using exploding dice on the top end. By allowing rerolls for your best results, you can create an unlikely burst at the high end. 
unlikely, but exciting and memorable when it happened, which is pretty characteristic of these types of power law mechanics. Another good way to create power law distributions with dice is to use the difference between two dice. With the D6s, zeros and ones are the most common, but the difference could be as high as five. I use that to great effect in the cyber hack table on Super Skill Pinball as part of a push your luck minigame. And the final way to incorporate power law into games is in the importance of the decisions. One option is for a game to have all equally important decisions. But in a power law distribution, most of the decisions that you make will be of small importance, but occasionally a really important decision will come along. And your choice in those key moments will typically be the difference between victory and defeat. Personally, I really like that type of decision distribution. Although it may seem like it diminishes the skill level, I actually think it's the opposite. The key is that you need to be able to recognize when the key decision points have arrived. If they always happen at exactly the same time, I agree that's not too much fun. But if these key decision points come at unpredictable moments, that can really separate the great players from the merely good. What do you think about a power law decision space? Do you like games where there are a few key moments? Or do you like every decision to matter equally? This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. Support for this episode comes from The Op, presenting The Batman Who Laughs Rising. Save the multiverse and the Justice League with The Batman Who Laughs Rising from The Op. From the Dark Knight Metal comic series, the evil hybrid of Batman and the Joker, The Batman Who Laughs is determined to destroy the multiverse and the Justice League needs to stop him. In this cooperative dice engine building game, gather your team and roll the dice to stop darkness from sweeping over the multiverse. Featuring characters from across the DC Universe, recruit heroes to fight the Batman Who Laughs. Included is a big Batman Who Laughs figure, full color, unique sculpt for the game. The co-op Dice Rolling Rising series puts players in a game against the clock. Can you survive and save the multiverse? The Batman Who Laughs Rising is available now at theop.games or your local game store. Questions. 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 All right, our first question is from Lindsay. Now, Lindsay says that she's been logging games on Board Game Geek for a couple years, and when she looking through the list of games, Battlestar Galactica was languishing with no plays in that time. As a side mm. note, they just announced a reprint of Battlestar Galactica. Yes, um, new theme, well, Cthulhu. Re-theme, yeah. too. Yeah, well, I was, yes, yes. Uh, they don't even mention Battlestar Galactica in the in the uh, print, but it is definitely the game redone. But anyhow, hmm. <laughs> uh, anyway, sort of talking in their younger energetic days, I'm trying to remember what those days were like. Anyway, when the baby <laughs> singular could be tucked in bed by 7 p.m., wow, 7 p.m., anyhow, um, <laughs> they were still up and awake and playing, and... Now they sigh and wonder if we'll ever get the game to the table again. The games we used to play when we first got into the hobby, says Lindsay, were long involved meaty games that were an intellectually rewarding experience. As our kids have gotten older now, 10 to 14, our games collection has changed its constitution to include more medium length, midweight, party games, light fillers. We still love to play the heavier Euros. We often don't have the time or energy or an evening to play them. By the time our kids are old enough, will we have lost the capacity or inclination to relearn the intricacies of Battlestar Galactica? I hope not. Lindsay is looking forward to a golden age of revisiting all those games, either with our kids or without them, at a game convention. When babysitters are no longer required, is my fear that we just won't be able to hack the pace again justified? What has been your experience, old people? Um, <laughs> it does... It doesn't, it doesn't say, say that, that Tom. <laughs> or the experience of those, you know, who are further on in the life cycle than us. That clearly means old people. That's like <laughs> I, mean. I feel very called out. <laughs> well, I, I'm still waiting for that uh, renaissance where the kids look at the shelf and go, "Ooh, I want to play this older title with you, father. Um, I, I, I have had some success bringing out some stuff from the, the back catalog and, and, and bringing out things that I've held on the shelf uh, for the kids to get older and, and able to understand things and, and met success there. Um, but I have also 
left things on the shelf or or we got some kids games that we thought would be really good uh, when we had kids that were old enough to play them um, that have languished um, because they, you know, the kids have outgrown them. Or when we did get a chance to play one of those games, the kids went, eh. <laughs> and like after all this buildup, they sort of turned up their noses at it. Um, so, no, you are not going to be the same person that you were back then, pre-children, um, but you will probably find some gems that you'll be able to go back to. Uh, it's it's hard, you know, things are going to be different, um, but I'm sure you'll, you'll be able to get the occasional game of BSG. See, one of the things is, is that you really do change, even if you think you don't. Um, I remember in college, I would, if you told me, hey, we're going to play Axis and Allies and it's going to take five, six hours, seven hours, I'd be like, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. Even if I had the time for that these days, and I could make the time, you know, I could say, oh, I'm going to clear a Saturday afternoon and do that. I've, I've been involved in a few things like that. And I thought, this isn't me anymore. I don't know that I want to do this kind of game anymore. And sometimes I've gone back to these games that I remember were amazing experiences and thought I've changed. So that's one thing. On the other hand, if you really want to play these games now, I would encourage you to make the time to do that. Maybe invite some people over to play the game and tell your kids they get to watch a movie while you're doing it. You yeah. know, um, or take turns, watch the kids and let the other person go out and play a game with a local game group or something. <clears throat> uh, my wife and I, well, see, we've we've gotten to the great point now where on Tuesday nights she comes and joins me for gaming now because our kids are now old enough to leave home alone but that's still nice few years down the road and you know what I'm still playing the lighter games you know <laughs> that is what it is but that's what my wife likes yeah. to play so that's what I'm going to play with her and um I don't know it's just I, I I think sometimes our longing to play these games is rooted in nostalgia uh that and you might find that you've changed. But then again, maybe not. Maybe retirement years will be the golden years. I already told my wife I'm excited about that. I thought I would be uh-huh. sadder about my kids leaving than I am. I got... Oh, okay. No. Okay, now, in case they're listening to the podcast, because this has bit me before. Okay, I love my children. And I have two now that have left the house out of seven. And, I'm, and it's like, wow, five kids is really easy to handle. They're now... Most of them operate on their own. I don't... I haven't changed a diaper in years you know, yeah. and that's and it's it's a different feeling, and and we're and we're moving into a different stage in our lives. And I'm thinking, this is good. When the kids will be gone, we'll we'll call them, we'll Facetime them, we'll visit them, and then we'll come back, and it will be just us, and we'll be okay. Mm. And, and then I'm gonna play battle. I'm not gonna play Battlestar Galactica, but I'll play something. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Suze? I- I'm on the same page. I think. You can't really predict how much your life is going to change between now and this kind of proverbial future. Just roll with it. Enjoy the games you can in the moment. And don't worry too much about the things you can't control in the future. Yeah. And who knows where you're going to be. And if you don't care for BSG, in five years or six years, that's okay. And then you can sell it for a gabillion dollars because that thing will never be reprinted. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I understand too. My my kids are getting to the age where they're a little more independent and, and things like that. And um, I, I would, uh, even without the kids involved or game time allocation involved, my gaming cha- tastes have evolved over the years, just naturally. Yeah. And, you know, just go along with the ride. So many great games are coming out every year. Games that you love today are still going to be good in five years, six years, seven years. It'll be okay. <laughs> I know, that wasn't really helpful. All right. Rich says, hey, guys, I'm a high school teacher that started a board gaming group at our school. Good for you, Rich. We have a fairly small collection of games and want to expand. We thought publishers might think it's worthwhile to donate some games in hopes of getting word out about their games. Do you have any suggestions for approaching publishers about donations? (laughs) So uh, I just looked it up here. There are about 24,000 high schools in America as of April. Yeah. But how many of those high schools are cool enough to have a teacher like Rich who starts a board gaming group at that school? Sure, maybe only one in a thousand 
which I doubt. We'll say maybe one in a hundred. Okay, if there's one in a hundred, that's two hundred and forty. But the the fact of the matter is, and I know this is not the news you want to hear, but I've talked to publishers, and maybe Suzanne can back me up on this that. The number of requests for board game clubs, board game schools, um, groups, church groups, yada, 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 is immense. And publishers mm. can't afford to send out 400 games. Uh, it, it's possible. It's possible, especially if you have a local publisher. Because then, then sure, they know you. Like, point. for example, <laughs> uh, I had someone who was doing this locally with a school. And I said, okay, well, you know what? I know someone who's local, but in this case, it was Restoration Games, that that <laughs> makes the exact kind of game you're looking for, like um, uh, the Downforce and such. And uh, and so I, I hooked them up and, 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 and introduced them. But other than that, the companies get inundated with reviewers asking for review copies with... People asking for a copy for this. With, there's a missing piece of my game. Could you replace the entire game? Um, that's not a joke. That actually happens. Hmm. And it's... you Go for it. But my suggestion is don't be disappointed if you don't even hear back from them. It's not that they're being rude. It's that they are highly inundated with that. I don't know, Suzanne. Maybe you have more light on the subject. Sure. And I always like to be really transparent whenever I talk on the podcast from kind of a, a publisher perspective so that I'm being very transparent. So I support restoration games on the back and you know, behind the scenes. Uh, so I don't want to you know make sure that any conflict of interest is kind of I'm being really open about that. So from that perspective, everything Tom, you said was absolutely correct. Publishers get so many requests for so many reasons, whether it's charity streams or reviewers or wonderful schools and clubs and churches that that have clubs. And exactly what you said, it, it it's overwhelming for publishers. They may not be able to respond. So if you want success, a few tips that may help, may not, make sure you're emailing from a school address, a school email address if you can, not like a personal Gmail account or something like that. Make sure that you have your name and your title. Um, provide a website link to the schools itself. Like if, you know, I'm Darrington High School. Great. Well, then provide the website link. I know Darrington High School has a website, right? Provide a link to your high school so that they, there's that. Talk about games that your club likes to play a little bit. And, you know, you don't need to write an essay. But I would, I would definitely, like, if you're asking for games, instead of just saying, hey, could you send us some games, speak to the publisher specifically. We think this game and this game and this game would be wonderful for our club. Uh, and, and really let the publisher know that you've engaged with their them as a publisher and you know their games and you're not just kind of shotgunning, mm. that you, you're making a very specific ask. You know, and, and definitely feel free to make it personal and like, I don't know, if you have a photo of your club at play, you know, without, you know, with respecting privacy, of course, and things like that. But things like that can all help. And then do, I said to avoid the shotgun approach. But then again, email a lot of publishers because 10 may not be able to do anything, but maybe two can. And hey, that's a few more games for your club. And yeah, definitely don't be discouraged if you don't hear back or if it's a no. It's definitely not personal. It's just small businesses being overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and you might uh, have, have some luck browsing uh you know secondary markets or or sale bins at your your local game store to find some more inexpensive older games that can fill out the library as well as just another avenue for filling out that library and it really is important to realize that your school district school people parents of your your kids there is money around and i would really try to see if you could get funding and then just you buy the games that you want you know, there there are ways to do that. You can present a to your 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 public your principal. Of course, your principals can tell you they don't have money, but they might. You know, yeah. and you the might. The PTA be might have a grant that they can you know do for this this particular club. Yeah, you never know. And if worse comes to worse for me, I buy the games, keep them in my personal collection, and take them in. Yeah, they'll get <laughs> beat up, but I'm gonna have fun in the meantime. Yeah. Jordan says, I've often heard that it's a faux pas for the teacher of a game to win, but what if it's also the teacher's first time playing? 
especially in a cult of the new group where it may be the only time the game gets played. I've also heard of people complaining that someone not trying to win ruins the game. So which is it? Should I try to win or not? Is it really like a faux pas? I mean, I say that as a joke, but does anyone really believe a well, I think teacher of you're, the game you're trying to win? You, you're trying to avoid the SmackDown aspect. That's like, different than you know, winning, though. <laughs> right. It, it, you know, yeah, I think that's what it is. You don't want the person who knows the game best to just be like, okay, so now I've taught you all this game, now I'm just going to destroy you all. And that's no fun for the new players. Um, but, yeah, whoever's teaching the game should at least play, you know, competently. You shouldn't, you know, purposely make mistakes. Um, well, there is- I, I, and, and certainly if it's everyone's first game, then everybody is going to be blundering about uh, and, and doing so equally, I think. I do have the experience, though. It is a faux pas if you're teaching a game for the first time. And then I look there and go... Oh, yeah. You know, I forgot to mention having the most money at the end of the game gives you an extra 30 points. <laughs> and I just yeah. so happen to have the most money. <laughs> I didn't realize this, everybody. I'm really sorry. Um, that's yes. that's where I might get annoyed a bit. That's a faux pas. Kevin says, is it time to dump my local game store? Well, let's let's dig into the why. So... Yeah. Uh, he found a game store in his area that opened up the same time he moved there. Very excited. It's the only game store within a few hours. Fantastic. But the store focuses almost exclusively on magic. Their selection of board mm. games is virtually unchanged. The staff has no knowledge of games other than magic. There's no events other mm. than magic. Um, Kevin offered to do a game night once a week. They said, no, thank you. Their games are full retail, never sales, rewards, program, or anything. When he asks for a game or expansion... They'll, they tell him they'll order it, but, you know, he's wondering if it's worth continuing to support them or switch online. Is there a benefit to the industry or hobby as a whole by shopping local? Or is it time to dump my friendly local game store? So I think that, first of all, the there's going to be an argument there. And I, and I don't, if, if you all are okay with this, I'm going to stay out of the whole buy local, buy non-local because there's some people who believe you buy local to help your local economy right and then there's some people who believe in a global economy and that's like a that's almost a, that's not what he's asking here but there would be some people who would tell right. you to buy from your local game store for that reason right i mean supporting the business simply because it is a business in your locality right R- regardless of how much value you're getting out of that particular business it's a shame that there isn't a competitor in town uh, because it is the only one. So, I mean, if this place went out of business, there'd be nothing local to, to buy at. But we've said before that if the F does not apply in friendly local gaming right. store, then you're not actually getting anything out of the, the, the purpose of, of buying from that place. If there is game space that you can use, if there's a library you can use, if there is knowledgeable staff that you can gain experience from, then yes, it is absolutely worth supporting your local store. But if they are refusing to cater to board gamers, then, I mean, there's a lot less incentive to keep them going. I'm sensing a polite disregard here. It doesn't sound like they're being unfriendly or malicious, not from the email. It just sounds like the ma- magic's the cash cow. And actually, I've been to local stores like this before where they like, oh, yeah, I guess I'll, you know, I'll get you a board game. They're polite and all, but yeah, I, so is Barnes and Nobles, you know, if I want to get a game from them. I wouldn't feel bad about it. I don't think it hurts the hobby if you order from someone else. That, that game store, if they're upset about it, could go out of their way to make it so you want to buy there. I'll tell you what, if you want to support the industry and you're going to the game store and you're willing to pay full price, order from the publisher directly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that does that does help like, the publisher out quite a bit. <laughs> but yeah, I think Eric really nailed it. It's not that this place is an unfriendly local game store, which I have unfortunately been in, but what it is, is it's a friendly local magic store. Your lack of buying there doesn't hurt their bottom line at all because they're not counting on that sale of Hollertow 
to give them profit, clearly, because they're not stocking it, they're not promoting it, right? If you were a Magic player, then it would be a different thing. So other than, yeah, supporting the local economy and things like that, finding another outlet where you feel more valued as a consumer seems like a very reasonable situation yeah. here. In, in somewhat of the store's defense, we've been to a few seminars at like the Gamma Trade Show and seen how the retailers are in a frenzy over magic. Uh, it is a huge chunk of, of a store's, a local store's business, uh, Magic the Gathering. And so it's hard to get upset at them for focusing on that when it's such a big part of their store. All righty. And let's see here. Tim says... I was curious if there was ever a game your game group enjoyed so much that you attempted to create alternate rules to expand the gameplay. You all tried to create a fresh take on a game that you've trounced each other in hundreds of times. (laughs) Our game group spent a whole night recently exploring Carcassonne this way. One of our attempts was implementing golf rules, so the lowest score won, which got cutthroat fast, adding tiles to other people's cities. Oh, interesting. We dealt out the tiles to have a hand to play strategically and quite a bit more options. We are currently hive-minding some added dice rolling in Quacks of Quedlinburg, creating character abilities in King of Tokyo, and some Wingspan shenanigans. (laughs) That's from Tim. I will say that if Wingspan has an expansion coming out, which I'm sure it does, Wingspan shenanigans is an awfully good expansion name. (laughs) Yes, after the Oceana expansion, the Shenanigan expansion. Exactly. I I mean, I I like that Carcassonne idea. The playing for the lowest score is kind of interesting. This is not necessarily my sensibility, though. Um, I I guess we've done, like, we'll do tournament rules or something. Back when my group was playing Formula D, we did a tournament, which is, I think, official, but not necessarily the standard way to play. Um, but I don't think we've really ever burned out on a game to the point that we want to start messing with all the levers and knobs. Yeah, I think this is this brings me back again to high school and college where I did do this. I'd play a game so much and I'd be like, oh, what what cool thing can we do with this? Now I'm like, huh, I played that game five times. That's pretty <laughs> yeah. cool. I still have four more characters I haven't played yet, right. but... <laughs> There's just so much in games. And then if the game does get boring, I kind of just move on to a different game, I guess. Uh, but this is this is cool. I'm trying to think about this low-scoring Carcassonne note. You must you have to place somebody, right? Otherwise, it doesn't work. I'd be like, I choose not to place anyone. Right, I just don't place. So I'm assuming you, you must always place someone every time you play a tile until you have nobody. Yeah. That could be interesting. I would... I have half a mind to try that. That is does sound interesting. And then so now you're trying to close off your cities and, and farms as quickly as possible. No it, one would ever place a farmer. It would be so, so nice. I'd be, Well, no, you might place a farmer in a really bad place, Eric. I guess. And, and it would be so Chip and Dale type. Oh, Eric, let me help you. Look at that, Eric. I made your city bigger. <laughs> you should be thanking me. Why are you weeping? <laughs> I just connected your two cities together. Ha 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 ha. All righty. Well, speaking of a lack of cooperation, it's time for the top ten. Time to go head to head. It's a dice tower top ten. The dice tower's top ten list is brought to you by Game Nerds at Game N E R D Z dot com. All right, folks, we're talking about dual games here. Now, this. Okay, so obviously. I didn't put an explanation on our website when people voted on these uh, because apparently dual means two-player game, and I I don't look at it that way. Yeah, I think it's a little more limited than that. I think in parentheses on our internal documents, you said a game where you knock the other person out. Yeah, well, or or they're... Av- I, so that's, that's what I did. I put a game where you're attacking the other player or their avatar. Mm-hmm. Something that, that's that's representing them or something like that. And even then, it's going to no one's going to we're going to argue over this list forever and ever. Amen. But yes, this is a very popular genre in um, CCGs. I actually expect that Suzanne to have Transformers on her list. Uh. Um, oh, darn it. 
you have time. You have time to fix it. <laughs> I, I know, but I love all the games on here. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, <laughs> she's gonna do it. <laughs> okay, never mind, Dad. But yes, this is this is the very epitome of many many uh, CCGs. In fact, I would say most CCGs are sure. attack the other person, yeah, yeah, take them out in some manner or fashion. Alrighty. Well, we'll see. Um, I. I'm not going to criticize Eric's list too much. Um, <laughs> Good. No. Good. Well, a little. You promised. But, uh, but because I'm just going to hold myself to my exacting standards. All right. I, I've given up on Eric. So, all right, let's get going. <laughs> Number 10. We're going to kick things off with a game that really got me into the hobby. I've mentioned it before. Pokemon. Got to catch them all. Got to catch them all. Uh, it is a battle game. Your object is to knock out six of your opponent's Pokemon, uh, and and the first player to do that will win the game. And uh, I, I'm I'm out of the curve of Pokemon. I have not been keeping up with the more powerful decks. And I, I know I've mentioned that when my kids started playing more recently, their newer decks just destroyed my classic ones that I was so proud of. Look at my old cards, kids. They just destroyed my decks. So I haven't played a lot lately. But I got to give credit to Pokemon number ten. Never played it. Oh. I, <laughs> You're fine. First up for me, nine number ten, Dinosaur Table Battles. This is a two-player game from Holland Spiel Games, in which you draft dinosaurs. You get a little team of dinos in front of you. You get their action cards. The action cards have things that they can do according to dice allocation. So you're going to roll some dice and then you allocate the dice to the action cards so that you can basically trounce on your opponent's dinosaur team and take away all of their action points. It's uh, a lot of fun. It's pretty quick. And there's some nice tension in how you get to allocate the dice and when you make certain moves and making the most out of a bad situation sometimes. I really enjoy it. Dinosaur Table Battles. Hmm. I like this concept a lot. My number 10 is uh, happily one of the crossovers. We'll get... Is it a crossover? No, it's not. I just have it. Yes, it is. Oh, it is a crossover. Yes, I was beaten to the punch by someone else. Uh, we'll get there. Um, a pun, 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 pun. Period. Well done. <laughs> Number nine. Number nine oh for goodness. me is going to show up on someone else's list. Uh, so I'll wait until I have a better move. That's how you do it. <laughs> Take lessons. Take notes. Number nine for me is the Transformers TCG. Which has always been there on your list. Which was definitely here from the very, very get-go. Uh, Transformers TCG, I am, of course, an old TCG fan. Play back, I've loved them since they were called CCGs. And when Transformers came out, it tapped into, you know, a childhood nostalgia thing for me because I loved the Transformers when I was a kid. And the card game was just fun. Not only did you have cars that turned into robots and vice versa so that you had that thematic element, but the the way that battle worked back and forth and the way that battle and defense and attacking worked, I thought was actually different in the world of TCGs overall and added something really compelling there. Uh, unfortunately, the TCG expansion is now done. They've since ended mm. the card game expansion, which just means, hey, you can go out and get the whole set now easily because the game is still good, even though they're not adding new cards. You can easily get it. I thought it was hard to get some of those sets. I may have some spares for you, Eric, if you need it. Oh, okay. Well, I did, based on your recommendation, I did get a couple of sets to play with the kids, and, cool. and they had fun. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's also, they did most of the Transformers you would know about. Yeah. True. It, in these sets. Yeah, this is a really fun one. I, I like this one a lot. My number nine is Battlecon, War of Endines, or Devastation of Endines, or something. It's, this is a fight game, a... Uh, Street Fighter type game and you put some cards together and fight the other person. There's a lot of these games out there. This is one of my favorites. It's simple. Well, okay, that's a lie. I just said it was simple. I can't believe I said it was simple. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's small. How's that? <laughs> no, it's not even small because they added 600 people in it. It's fun. <laughs> and you, <laughs> you get a small deck of cards and you're combining two cards each time 
to do a move and trying to outthink your opponent. It's a very complicated version of rock, paper, scissors, trying to beat up the opponent. I really like it. That's War of Indines. Number eight. My number eight is also a rock, paper, scissors mechanism, and one of the first games I thought of when I started thinking about this subject. That is Yomi, a game from David Serlin um, that, that emulates sort of a Street Fighter-style battle. Uh, you have a deck that relates to a particular character, a deck of cards that has you know punches and blocks and kicks, and um, one will defeat the other in a rock, paper, scissors style thing. So you're playing face down cards and then revealing and, and seeing how those two moves interact and trying to knock down the hit points of your opponent. I, I like the way that it all interacts and I think it fits the theme so incredibly well. Um, it's one that I let go just because it wasn't hitting the table for me uh, nearly as often as I would have liked for that style of game, but a very ambitious style of game with all the different characters and one that certainly fits the list. Yomi, number eight. Very nice. My number eight, Skulk Hollow. I really like this game in which it's asymmetric. So one player is going to take on this big, giant beast character and then the other player takes on this little team of woodland creatures and the two are basically battling it out but they play very differently in terms of how the little beasts how the little forest creatures attack different areas on the beast and how the the big beast moves around the board and the forest i think it was unique it's fun it's not too complex i actually would love to see an expansion for it skulk hollow it's a great two-player duel game. Hmm. All right. So I have more integrity than others here because when I saw that on Sue's list, I thought I should put that on mine. But no, I've already <laughs> made my list. Actually, that's not true. It was like my number 11. It's a really sure. good game. I like it a lot. My number eight is higher on someone else's list. So, oh, 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 we'll get there later. So you're saying you're all tapped out and, and you don't want to talk about it now? Oh, my word. Don't. Write the answer out for the kids. I've been waiting. <laughs> number seven. My number seven is Seven Wonders Duel. Duel is right there in the title. Now, this actually is the one that fits the least well into our rules because the duel aspect, the actual taking out of your opponent, is only one of the ways to win in Seven Wonders Duel. There's a military track. As you get military cards, you push a little token from one side to the other. And if you manage to get all the way to the end, it's an instant instant win uh, for the game, but that is only one of the aspects. Most of the ways to win in Seven Wonders Duel are points related, but still, it's something you have to worry about. To uh, You don't want to let yourself get pushed over the edge in Seven Wonders Duel. My number seven. I really wanted to say something, but you already said what I was going to say. That is why we work so well together, Tom. I Terrible anticipate choice. your criticisms. Terrible choice. Terrible choice. Did, did you put it at number seven because it's Seven Wonders Duel? I don't know what you're talking about, Suzanne. Mm. It just happened so that way. Nose, it just Eric. worked that way. And he's been that I... way this whole list. You haven't noticed? I know. It's, it's what's on tap. Ha, ha, ha. That was amazing, <laughs> My... amazing reference. And anyway. Everybody knows that because everybody got it from it, Eric. <laughs> My number seven <laughs> was lower on Tom's list, and that is... Dice Throne. Dice Throne has you picking a character, getting some custom dice, getting a big old action board that's unique to that character, and you duel it out with another player. Now, I know you can play this game with more people, but I love it as a duel. I think it's best at two players and mixing and matching the combat. I love how you can allocate the dice to the actions. You can push your luck a little bit with more rolls with that Yahtzee element. Really solid, really fun not too heavy, great to just throw down between you and another friend, Dice Throne, my number seven duel game. Yeah, Dice Throne, I think, works best as a duel. You can play it multiplayer, you can do all kinds of cool things, but I really like it just head-to-head, -head. and every match feels different, and it's so asymmetrical, it's fantastic. My number, sorry, I always think it's my, I'm done talking about it. My <laughs> number seven is Mage Wars Academy. Now, I also like Mage Wars a lot, but Mage Wars Academy is a more streamlined version, and I tend to like more streamlined games. In Mage Wars, you are a mage of different types. You summon creatures to help you fight the opponent. Sounds very similar to another game you may have heard of, 
But in this one, you get to build your spell book before the game, but then you pick which spells you're going to play each turn. You don't. There's not a deck. You're going through. You have a certain number of points you can spend, and so it's very strategic. Now there's there's still luck in it. You're throwing dice to hit the other person, but I really like this one. This one really does well for me. Um, I I they haven't published anything new for it for a while, but I still think it's a lot of fun, and I love that idea of building your spell book ahead of time. So that's Mage Wars Academy. Yeah, that menu aspect is really kind of cool to to have your full army at your fingertips. And as long as you have enough, what is it, summoning power to bring them out, you can do so. Number six. My number six is a chess variant called For the Crown. It's from Victory Point Games. Uh, and and it, it matches chess with deck building. And as you build your deck, you can sacrifice those cards to bring out new and cool pieces onto the board. And the object is to take out the opponent's king. Um, I, I, I like the the mix of the familiar and the novel in For the Crown. Uh, it's my number six. Yeah. I I don't know. I mean, do you believe that... You know what? I'm going to let Suzanne go first, and I'm going to say my comments because they apply to both of you. Oh. 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 Well. Oh. All righty. Well, now I'm a little afraid to move forward. Uh, my number six... That's all positive. ...was <laughs> lower on Eric's list, and that's... Onitama. Onitama is a two-player game reminiscent of the Duke in which you've got a lineup of pawns, including a lead pawn, and you are using cards with configurations of movement on them to manipulate your pawns to either to, to try to take over the opponent's space or run into the opponent's uh, pawns. And you just have five cards for the whole game. So you have five moves that you can use. And as you use a move, it becomes available to your opponent to move or six moves. But I love that give and take. I love when you have to hold back a card because you know your opponent can use it against you mm. and you don't want them to have access to it. It's quick. It's simple. It's compelling. There are so many different cards you can mix and match to add a ton of variety and make it play out differently every time. I've loved this game ever since I played the older version from Japan, and I still love it today in the newer updated version. That's Onatama. Agreed. This was my number nine. I I, I love the, the thinky, uh, the, the, the brain-burning aspect of this. And and as you said, Suze, the, uh, the holding back of a card, because you know that if... If you get a hold of this, you will capture my my master, or you will be able to move into position and win the game. And so I have to figure out a way to negate that advantage before I let you have that card. Uh, it's it's a pretty neat neat system. I'm just not sure abstract games fit this genre, because if so, then couldn't the whole thing be abstract games? Yeah, but this isn't patchwork, you know. Yeah, but, but I, I mean, chess fits on this list. There's sure. lots of games where you capture other pieces. Yeah. But but chess but is farther still, back. Uh, like, that was my number aggression. 11. Well, you just picked essentially chess anyway. What? Okay, so, no. I mean, I think I think having a, uh, a face-to-face, you know, two-army battle, uh, abstract as it may, is still a duel. Yeah, but if that's the case, then every war game is a duel. Uh, okay, I I saw p- many people suggesting Memoir Forty Four to be one of the the games on this list. I highly disagree with that. I so, I mean I really disagree with that because otherwise duel doesn't mean anything other than a two player game. So you're you're th- well except like patchwork is not. Well, <clears throat> you haven't seen the People's Choice yet, but yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you're you're thinking a single, a one one object versus one object. Well, yeah, that's like that's what a duel is. I don't say, oh, the United States and Germany had a duel back in 1945. Okay, I'm just thinking of a duel being, you know, two commanders having a face to face interaction. Sure, that's it's used that way. All right. You're both right. You're both right. Um, I, I got to I got to backpedal now. We win. Now here's the thing. Woo! We did it. We did. It. That's not. That's we not how it works. We defended our thesis. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So doctors, listen to my number six here. So shards of infinity actually feels somewhat similar in that you have a bunch of battles 
uh, of d- different creatures and things. It's 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 kind of a riff on um, Star Realms. Mm-hmm. It's a, a deck building, but you are attacking the enemies. You have a hit point total that's going down. That's why I put this on the list because there's this hit point total that you're constantly digging at. It's some unknown person or it's a life point. Star Realms actually I thought fit this also quite well, but I like Shards of Infinity better just because of the deck building aspect. But I like this idea. You're, some cards heal you, some cards just attack the enemy, and some cards help produce resources for you to buy more stuff. So I like it a lot. Shards of Infinity. I love Shards of Infinity. I really struggled. I, I wanted to put it on my list. It's such a great deck builder. So I was really glad to see it on your list. Yep, it made Huzzah. my short list as well. Number five. My number five is Shot and Totten or Battle Line, uh, where you're facing off on the field of, of battle, except you're trying to win marker stones uh, by playing cards in these various columns uh, and and trying to out uh, outplay the opponent with a better combination of cards and even proving that you can win a particular battle uh, because your opponent cannot play cards that are going to defeat you. And I, I like that that deduction aspect of the game as well. Uh, Shot and Totten is my favorite, but battle line, I'll take it in a pinch. My number five. Just a classic. My number five is higher up on somebody else's list, so I'll just try to build a wall and hang out behind it. All right. Um, My number five is higher on someone else's list because I'm really low on puns today. (laughs) Number four. My number four is going to show up on someone else's list, so I'm just going to build a wall and hide behind it. Nice. Nice. I should have, yeah, that was a good <laughs> but better use of it, buddy. Good job. My number four is not higher on anybody else's list, which is a shame because it's ashes. Well, I'm, I'm, maybe the second edition will swing me around. I'm going to give it another whirl and see. I, I hope you do. I, I do. I have gone through some of the characters and looked at kind of how they switched them up. And I think they actually did a fair amount of rebalancing, depending on what you didn't care for in the first edition. So Ashes or Ashes Reborn now is a TCG like game with custom dice. So there are different kind of factions of dice. You pick a character that's got a completely unique deck. You can deck build if you want to, or they kind of come out of a package ready to play, which quite frankly is how I play it. Mm -hmm. And you get a big fistful of dice depending on your deck build. And those dice will determine in part what actions you get to take with your cards. You're going to build up a tableau of characters and creatures and spells that you use to defend yourself and to battle against your opponent. The flow of the game is really interesting. And one of the things I always liked about Ashes is how it kind of turns some of the rhythms of a CCG on its head for me. And again, just like with Robo earlier, I like games that kind of turn my expectations upside down and make me explore a game in a different way. And Ashes does that for sure. And with the New Reborn, I got the, I mean, I have a ton of Ashes from the first printing, so I just got the... uh, upgrade pack that they release that let you update all of your uh, previous characters. I've been having a lot of fun re-exploring this game, and I think they've done a great job with the Reborn version of it. So, Hmm. my number four, Ashes. My number four is Dice Masters, which has a lot of similarities to collectible card games, and I'm not sure who you are in Dice Masters, because you have a bunch of heroes, Spider-Man and Superman and whatever, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but you're hitting the other person's life total, which is 20, and knocking it down. Uh, This is very similar to, well, Magic the Gathering and other games. You know, you have a life point total. So this has that same thing. I still like Dice Masters. I don't, you know, it's it's fading for me a bit, and it's overwhelming because I have (sighs) 7,000 different dice slash cards. That's not actually, that may not be an exaggeration. Um, but there's a lot of Dice Masters out there, and I like it, so it's my number four. I, I considered this one. I, it made the short list. It's, it's one I still need to play with the kids because I think they'd like it. Number three. Number three is Puzzle Strike. This is another David Serlin creation that, that emulates the, like, super puzzle fighter style of game. Uh, you're trying to overwhelm the opponent by crashing gems onto their play field. Uh, it's also a... 
bag building game. You're you're building chips and buying chips to put into your bag. There are character specific chips.、Uh, in fact, the same characters from Yomi are in Puzzle Strike,、uh, and you are are trying to overwhelm the opponent with their, your gems.、Um, It can be played with more than two players, but I think it's best as a one-on-one duel.、Um, and and I just I really like the theme and I like the mechanisms as well. Number three, Puzzle Strike. My number three is higher up on somebody else's list, so I'm just gonna build a wall and hang out behind it for a while. Well done. They're not、Thank、walls、you. anymore. They're now portals. What? Shh. Gates. They're gates. Same thing. My number three is Codex. Codex is a game that mixes the build your have your own spell book like Mage Wars, deck building like Dominion, and attack the other person like Magic the Gathering. It's ridiculously silly in that regard, but it plays really well. Lots of different options and ways to attack your opponent and destroy them. It is fun. It is expensive. It's hard to find.、Um, but this is my personal list, and I just really like Codex. So、mm. my number three. Is Codex number two? My number two. Tom mentioned when he was talking about Shards of Infinity. It also made Suzanne's list as a number five game. It's Star Realms. This is a,、uh, a deck building game in which you're trying to knock down your opponent's life total,、uh, and and you're acquiring ships and space stations and stuff to、uh, defend yourself and to attack and to replenish your health.、Um, getting synergy with the different suits,、uh, different factions of cards. That That you can acquire. There's tons of expansions to this game, and and in fact, it, it's gotten quite complex,、uh, complicated as as you're、uh, adding all of these expansions.、Uh, but Star Realms is a lovely, tight game, even with just the、uh, the base cards.、Um, it, it's a very, very focused、uh, sort of one on one duel、um, as you're trying to knock down the opponent. I really like it. Star Realms number two.、Whoa. Yeah, I've I've played almost twenty five hundred games of Star Realms.、What? So. I'll just leave that information there. That's a there. lot. Let me. Yeah, the app is just so easy to use. <laughs> so let me ask you both this: Why, to me,、um, Shards Infinity is such a clear improvement on Star Realms? Why did you put you, you since you both played Star Realms? Why did you pick Star Realms over Shards of Infinity? Theme. Okay, that's reasonable. That the Shards of Infinity is some weird, wonky sci-fi theme. Yeah. I, I think I. I mean, they are very similar,、um, but I think I just like I like the spaceships a little better. For me, it's just you know, I, I Star Realms was first. Ah,、and、okay. I, I still、Two、think good it's, reasons. It's great, and I just I've played so much of it. I do love Shards of Infinity, though, and I agree with a lot of your comments there. All righty, my number two, War Chest. I'm wondering if Tom's going to call me on this one. No,、Tom? well. Actually, I'm doing first a callback all the way to the beginning of the episode、yes. when you talked about switch and signal. Same designer here in War Chest. It is, and now oh, that's right. I remember that now. He mentioned it when I I was communicating with him, and I had not played. I've not played War Chest, so it was it, it wasn't one that I immediately jumped to mind. It's an amazing game,、sure. should be in his list, but it's an amazing game. Ah,、uh, yeah, yeah, that's. I was waiting for that one. Fair enough, but you are,、uh, put well, I, and I actually have played it four player, and it played really, really well. But two players, you build up a little bag or a little set of characters that are represented by poker-like chips tokens that you put on the board, and you maneuver as units. Cards will represent what those units can do, and you are maneuvering around the board, trying to take control of specific spots on the board and wipe out your opponent's units as you go. It has a tremendous amount of variety. The tactical gameplay is so impressive. I love War Chest so much, and I did put it on here because you are knocking out opponent's units. There is kind of that、uh, battle. Element where you really are f- technically fighting. Although I understand Tom where you're coming from from that abstract point of view and the area control point of view. I I kind of see your point there, but、uh, I don't care. I'm leaving on here because War Chest is great. I don't care at all, actually.、Um, what I do remember about this game is this is in one of my top ten proud moments in gaming. There's a lot of it's not my best moments, but you know I like beating the designer in a game. And me、nice. and Melody played against the designer. And Jason Levine were on the same team,、What? and we and we beat him. And nice. I immediately、wow. said, "I'm done playing this game forever. I won."、Um, <laughs> I did play it more after that, but I did feel like retiring at that point. <laughs> 
My number two is a game that sounds like it doesn't fit on this list, but I think it does, and that's Thunder and Lightning, which is the uh, Hera and reworking Zeus? of Hera and Zeus. Yeah. And in this game, you're trying to beat the other person, and you do so in a Stratego sort of way, but also by pulling cards from their hands. So I could see why you might say it doesn't fit on the list, but I think it does because you're searching for that one card. Poof! You get it, you win. And it's a... Maybe it doesn't fit on the list. But it's an amazing game, Thunder and Lightning, <laughs> and I've allowed so much nonsense so far, I get one. And finally, number one. My number one was Tom's number five, and I bet it would be on Suzanne's list too, but the conflict of interest, because Suzanne... Is that why you didn't put it on your list, Suzanne? You're probably. allowed to put it on your list. Uh, no, I feel very uncomfortable doing anything like that, so I chose not to, but... I was glad to see it on your guys' Unmatched list. is the game. It's the reworking of Star Wars Epic Duels, uh, a, a refined system um, with, with tons of characters now, uh, and, and you can't fit them all in one box anymore, which is slightly annoying but also very cool. Uh, nice um, movement mechanisms, line of sight mechanisms, and each character is different as, as you go on a you know this tactical battle trying to knock out your opponent and and maybe their henchmen as well. Uh, there are team battles that isn't quite a duel, but um, it's still two sides, and and I I just love the way it all works together. Unmatched is my number one duel game. Yeah, it's really good. And actually, when I was originally making the list, I had put. Um, Funko Verse on here because I was like, oh, I like Funko Verse better than Unmatched. But the difference here is Funko Verse, you have a group of three. In Unmatched, you have one usually, mm. and you might have a sidekick or something with you. And I was like, yeah, Unmatched fits this list better. So that's why I put that on the list. I like it a lot. And I'm actually behind on Unmatched. I have not played half of the new stuff mm. easily. So I need to get caught up on that. You know what's going to get me in? Marvel. <laughs> it's- oh, just you wait. You don't even know how good it's going to be. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I, I'll stop talking about it now. Sorry. You're, you're free to talk. We, we allow Dice Tower all sorts of spoilers and stuff if that's okay. Um, I don't need Justin coming after me. What's your number one, Oh, Suzanne? please. Justin is like a leaky faucet with information. <laughs> he, I'm not the one you have to worry about. He tells, me, he tells me stuff all the time. I know. Ugh. I, anyway, I all right. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll email all you All right. My number one was lower on Tom's list. Lovely to see it there. Magic the Gathering. I, I, I love magic. <laughs> I I've played Magic for 26 years. I love this game. I still play it. I play it in a different format, though. I don't do a ton of really custom deck building or things like that. But I love all the various formats like EDH or Commander or Pack Wars or all these simpler ways to play. The root of the game is buried deep in my heart and it'll never let go where yet. Yeah, make your deck and you cast spells and you throw out creatures and you're tapping for resources. I, I love Magic the Gathering and I understand why some people don't. I understand how the game has grown and bloated and evolved over <laughs> the years, but I sure do love Magic the Gathering. And when you define dual game, yeah. there you go. Yeah, I, everything there. I'm actually... I haven't played Magic for eh, maybe a year. It's when when I'm not going to the local game store all the time, I'm not tempted to pick up new packs. But ah, uh, this upcoming Lord of the Rings Magic the Gathering, mm-hmm. that's gonna really pull me in. I think. Nice. Uh, you know <laughs> it. They got they got some cool themes. I mean, I think they're doing Warhammer. And I'm not as interested in that. Um, but the the Lord of the Rings sounds really cool. So, yeah. Yeah, this is such a great one. My number one is the only game that hit all three people's lists because it is the ultimate. It should have been higher on all their lists, but whatever. (laughs) And that is Summoner Wars. Specifically, I want to say Summoner Wars 2nd Edition, but let's say Summoner Wars 2nd Edition hadn't been out yet. I would put the 1st Edition at number one because it is that good. But I will put Summoner Wars Edition 2 as number zero. This is one of my favorite games. It is amazing. You have a summoner with a group of guys, but the whole point isn't to defeat your opponent's army. It's to defeat their summoner. You do that, you win. You can. The second edition has a box of six 
different armies. They're all very, very different. It is clean. It is fast. It is one of the best games ever designed in the history of card gaming. So, I, yeah, I, I agree that it deserves to be on the list, uh, obviously. It, it's, I love the way the different factions play differently and, and have different strategies to them. And, and, yeah, even from the beginning, we were very much impressed with the first edition of Summoner Wars. I have not yet seen the second edition, um, but it looks really cool. Now, as an academic discussion, though, Summoner Wars belongs on this list, according to Tom, but for the crown in which the object is not to knock out your opponent's pieces, but your opponent's king, doesn't belong on the list? Why is that? Yeah. Because. Oh, okay. Thank you. I rest Good my argument. case. Good, good job. I think I'm right. <laughs> I don't feel like your uh, king is leading your army. In Summoner Wars, your summoner is definitely leading your army and leading the charge. Uh-huh. Okay, sure. You also can't have two kings fighting each other at the end, and you can't have two summoners fighting at the end. Also, your summoner is the one who's playing all the <laughs> cards in the game. Your king does nothing except get out of check. How, how do you done. know he doesn't run everything? He doesn't. You're not the king. You're the queen. Which is the most powerful piece on the chessboard after all. There you all. go. All right, I agree. Queen's Gambit. Watch the show. Okay, let's move on. Oh, that's me. Okay, so <laughs> the people's choice. Here we go. Number 20, War of the Ring. Number 19, Shot and Totten and Battle Line. Although, Eric, you said you like Shot and Totten better than Battle Line. They're literally the same game. Uh, yeah, there's there's like action cards in Battle Line. No, in Shot and Totten, they added the action cards in. Not in my copy. You're Okay, fine. Number 18 is Fox in the Forest. 17, Yinch. 16, Watergate. 15, unmatched. 14, so very low. Summoner Wars. Lower than 13, chess. Well, okay. Memoir 44 at 12. Lost Cities at 11. Mm. Raptor at 10. Okay. By the way, I get it. And I'm not, I, I, if I, folks, if you voted, I'm not criticizing. I get it. All these games, a two player game that's fierce and combative is a duel. I get it. I'm just being s- semantic for. I don't know. I like the bug, Eric and Suzanne. Mm-hmm. All right, number eight, Star Wars Rebellion. Number seven, What about Jaipur. nine? You forgot about nine. Yeah, you skipped nine. Oh, nine is Targi. Sorry. Um, or Asante, I suppose. Um, seven is Jaipur. Six. Oh, I'm sorry. That's Asante, not Targi. Jaipur. Anyway, six, Onitama. Five, Star Realms. Four, Magic the Gathering. Three, Patchwork. Two, Twilight Struggle. And one, Seven Wonders Duel. I told trivia you, time. it's in the title. Okay, well, trivia time. What other games have the word duel in them that are highly rated on Board Game Geek? Duel of Ages. Yep. I said highly rated, Eric. Somebody's favorite game. It used to be. A duel. I'm actually looking. Duel of Ages is 2,463. <laughs> 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 All right, let me, I'll just give them to you because it will take too long. So... Uh, skipping all the ones that are dual in another language, the first one I come down to is Dulosaur Island, ah, the uh, okay. two-player dinosaur island. Then Star Wars Epic Duels. Yep. Then we have Emotep the Duel. Yep. Space Cadets Dice Duel. Yep. The which, very oddly named Antique Duelum. Yep. Which is a garbage game. Oh, never mind. Here's Duel of Ages Two. That's at one thousand five hundred seven. Ah, okay. There you go. Then Epic Spell Wars of the Battle Wizards Duel at Mount Skullsfire. Yes. Then King Domino Duel. Yes. Bonanza the Duel. Ubongo Duel. Duel in the Dark, which is a great deduction game. Mm. Yeah, okay, I'm done with the duels. There's a lot of games <laughs> with the word duel in it. Cosmic Encounter Duel, but that's way down the list. 3,292. It's new. Give it some time. It won't go up. <laughs> No, I don't think it will. I, I thought it was fine, and I don't think it's going to garner an audience. Also, it, it came out in that very, very bad time of the year for the games that come out. The, I mean, if a game that came out from March 2020 till, I'd say, now, and isn't an amazing game, it's struggling. Right? Sure. Just because of everything that went on 
But some games are are, are are coming above that. But I think... I don't even... Why am I going off on tangents today? I don't should know. Should I go to bed? I should go to bed. Probably a good idea. All righty. Well, thank you, Suzanne, for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. For sending in questions. And uh, I think that's it. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Eric Summerer. Have fun dueling. But don't, because it's not legal. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode number 714 was recorded on June 10th, 2021. Mandy and Suzanne join you next week, and in two weeks, Tom and I go hunting for a top 10 unknown children's games. Support for this podcast comes from listeners like you. Thank you for spreading the word. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. Find out more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and Eric, with production assistance from Roy Canaday, Mike Delisio, Chris Yee, and Rob Seary. Our theme was composed by Timothy Pinkham. Empire building for clumsy people brought to you by Oaf. And hosting is provided by Game Nerds, your all-in-one solution for all your nerdy needs at GameNerdsWithAZ.com. We love feedback. Visit the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com. Email us at Tom at DiceTower.com, Suzanne at DiceTower.com, or Eric at DiceTower.com. Or follow us on Facebook. And of course, you can find more from the Dice Tower Network, including Board with Video Games, Meeple Overboard, Solosaurus, Sporadically Board, Flip Flory Super Saturday Board Game Serial, Board Game Design Lab, and Dice Tower Now at DiceTowerNetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. So what if we went with the other meaning of duel, D-U-A-L, and, and it was games that do have a pair, like, uh, you know, first and second editions of games, or um, well, that's all I got. Or main games and card games versions, yeah. like, you know, Castles of Burgundy and Castles of Burgundy, the dice. They complement each other. Room so service and room service, the card yeah. game. Uh, or it's Zuloretto a game and, it- and Colorado. It's a game, but doubles as something else. It's a dual game slash table. Ooh. I do have a couple of those. They make amazing monetarizers. I think we should end the episode with the word. Monetarizers? (laughs) (laughs) Wait, wait, wait. Isn't that what happens when you start running advertisements on your podcast? You've monetarized it? (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Eric, why do you hate me? (laughs) 